in the book of Daniel tonight, so if you have your Bible, find uh, Daniel chapter 5, and we'll be looking at the verses there in that story, and <clears throat> as you remember last week, last week was the last chapter, chapter 4, that uh, talks about King Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that uh, he was a, a king for a long, long time over Babylon, over that region of the earth. And as uh, King Nebuchadnezzar passed on uh, the, the kingdom to uh, his uh, uh, son and grandson, uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 5 tonight, and it's 20 years after what we left last week. And what has happened is uh, Belshazzar is now the king of Babylon. And uh, as he's the king, he's also uh, having something happen just outside his gates and around him uh, of the capital city that uh, is a part of historical record. But the Medes and the Persians were uh, coming to lay siege to the city. And as everything was taking place, Belshazzar the king decides to have a feast and bring a thousand of his nobles in for the, the feast. And as they're there... He does a lot of things because he doesn't follow the ways of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had understood the one true holy God of all the universe. And Belshazzar didn't follow uh, the teachings of uh, his father. And so now he's in a very, very bad place in his own life, in the life of the kingdom, and also in the, uh, the, the life of serving God in any uh, fr uh, form or fashion, and so <coughs> Daniel is brought in, uh, brought on the scene to do what he always does, to be the faithful one living in a foreign land that interprets the direction of the holy God that creates and dictates all of the universe that he's created, and so we see this story tonight unfold, and the amazing thing about it is uh, how how Daniel continues to be faithful and continues to be a blessing even in the middle of a terrible circumstance and a terrible situation. So when we look at the scripture tonight, it comes back to a saying that you uh, probably use in your everyday conversation. Has anybody ever used the, the, the saying, well, the handwriting's on the wall? Well, they, it comes from this passage. And what does it mean when you say the handwriting's on the wall? It means that whatever, the, whatever the, there's a foregone conclusion going to take place. There's something that's going to happen. I mean, uh, several years ago in 2019, you know I'm a baseball fan, and I follow everything the Braves uh, ever, do, ever have done. And back in 2019, the Braves were in the playoffs. And they were motoring along pretty well. But then in one of the games, uh, their starting pitcher began pitching in the first inning, and before the first inning was over, the opposing team had scored 10 runs. So that's what we call in baseball, the handwriting is on the wall. It's over, you know, even in the first inning, and it was. Sometimes that happens in our lives every day, doesn't it? There may be a situation that comes, and you know, well, that's going to happen. We can, we can see it in front of us. We can know that this is going to take place. Well, here, the handwriting on the wall was God's judgment on Belshazzar, the king, and the whole kingdom for the way that he had governed the kingdom over the time that he had been the king. And in all of it, the handwriting was on the wall, and it was God's hand that was doing the writing. When God's hand does the writing, what can you count on? It, it, it's going to be done. It's going to be accomplished. It's going to be finished. And so that's what we're going to read about and look about tonight in Daniel chapter 5. So as we read it and look at it, we're going to uh, see, first of all, verses 24 and 25 that you'll see up on the screen behind me. And we'll read those two verses and see uh, what that's about. And then, uh, because this is really about the judgment that is being passed upon King Belshazzar. So it says in verses uh, 24 and 25 in the scripture, then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, meaning God, and this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, 
Mene, mene, tekel, yifarsin, or your translation may say Perez at the end of it because the New King James also uses that same word in the, uh, in the uh, interpretation. And Daniel goes on to interpret what was on the wall as the hand of God wrote on the wall. This is the interpretation of each word in verse 26. Mene means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel means you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command that, and they clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, when we look at this, we, we see what happens in Daniel's life and eventually what happens in the king's life. And when we look at it, we recognize it, we know that all of us deal with sometimes inevitable things in our lives, things that are the foregone conclusion that's about to happen, consequences that come because of choices we make, consequences in King Belshazzar's life and for the kingdom of Babylon were coming because they had not honored the one true God, because God of the universe who's Daniel's God and our God dictates and says what happens among the kings and the nations in the world. Even today, we may be sitting back looking at all of the chaos in the world, but I would just encourage you to know that God still hasn't lost control of his universe. God is still sitting on the throne of all of his universe and all of his kingdom. He's allowed men and women to make choices. And there are consequences for those choices, and we're going to see those consequences continue to play out until Christ comes for his church, and then the uh, seven years of tribulation take place on the earth, and then the final glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus upon the earth when we come with him, and the judgment that will take place upon the earth totally during that time. But until that time, what do we recognize? We recognize that uh, God allows us to make choices, and our choices have consequences. So what do we see from this scripture that ought to speak to us tonight? Recognizing 20 years have passed, King Belshazzar has taken over from his father, Nebuchadnezzar, and has not run the kingdom very well. And as we see, the Medes and the Persians are, wait, are the enemies waiting at the gate to come in and take over the whole kingdom, and that's part of the consequence of what happened. The same consequences happened earlier when Daniel and his three friends and all the, of his people in the nation of Judah were taken out of uh, Judah by Babylon. Why did that happen? Because of the consequences of the people's lack of trust in their God. They refused to worship the one true God who saved them, who brought them, who placed them there in that promised land. And because they worshipped idols instead of God, because they, they mocked God in the way that they worshipped even in the temple, God allowed the Babylonians to come in and conquer them and take them out of their land and take them off to a foreign land. Of course, Daniel, his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all of the, the rest of the young ones that came from Judah to Babylon to be schooled and trained there, they showed themselves faithful by standing up for who God is. And because of that, Daniel becomes a leader in the land. And even as many times as he is tested and tried, he remains the faithful leader that God had in, ordained him to be. And so were his friends, leaders in the kingdom. And because of that, God blessed the kingdom nation of Babylon until this time. And then he's also going to bless the Medes and the Persians that come in to take over Babylon. But all of this points back to one thing. We all have the enemy or the satanic or evil influences that are at the gates of our life sometimes. Often, every single day, we're battling some challenge that comes spiritually from the world. But the the great thing about our God is we can always count on him to be here for us as we obey him and follow him. 
When the enemy's at the gate of your life, there are three things I want you to take away tonight. One is, we pray and seek God, we never mock God. We pray and seek Him, we don't mock Him. Now, you might ask, preacher, how do we mock God today? Well, you might think about ways that we mock God in, in how we live. When we take away from His glory, we mock God. When we uh, try to take tribute, uh, tr uh, take uh, uh, the credit for things that God has done, we mock God with our lives. When we try to bring Him down to our level, I think that's one of the things that bothers me the most uh, in the world, is when we try to bring the almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent God down to our level. And speak about God as if he is a human being. Well, Jesus did and is, did live as a human being above, uh, among us. But he is still God. Sinless God. And we'll never reach that place until Jesus comes for us. And only through Christ can we have salvation, right? And so in every way, we pray and seek God with our life. We don't mock him by the way we live or how we act or what we do. And when we do make those mistakes, what do we do? Will we find forgiveness when we confess our sins before him and ask him to forgive us? One of the things that we find here in Daniel chapter 5, and I'm going to read the first few verses of the chapter so you can follow along there beginning with verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of, a th of the thousand. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now, you all, you all remember that, don't you? You remember... When Nebuchadnezzar came in and conquered Jerusalem, he took all of the sacred uh, instruments and, and items of gold and silver uh, and er everything that had been used in temple worship, he took them out and put them in his treasury. Now, one of the things Nebuchadnezzar learned is he learned that the one true God of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were... Uh, was uh, an all-consuming God. And last week we read about the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was, was driven out uh, in to eat with the donkeys, you know, as a wild beast for seven years to really get God, really got his attention and said, I'm the one who puts you up and I'm the one who can take you down. And so he got his attention and we read about what Nebuchadnezzar said in uh, chapter 4, how he praised the one true God of all the earth and how he, he uh, you know, repented in his life and got right with the one true God. Now we see his son, Belshazzar, and what is he doing? He is mocking God by taking the very temple vessels that uh, were, were taken out from the temple and were only used to honor God in the temple, and he brings them out to the feast for all of his folks to drink wine from. And so he mocks God in the presence of everybody who's there, those, that thousand that were there. And then it says, they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, verse 3, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. And they drank wine. And what else did they do in verse 4? They praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. So in every way, they were mocking God. And one of the things we know that the Scripture reminds us about in the New Testament, in Galatians 6, verse number 7, the Bible says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So when we mock the one true God of the universe, when we try to bring God down to our level, what we're, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're, we're saying, God, you're no more important to me than anything else in the world. And if, if we're a believer in Christ, we know that's not right. We know that's not the way we should act or speak or, or live. 
But yet, even in our Christian life, sometimes we neglect to honor God the way we should. We neglect to give Him the glory for our life, to thank Him properly, to come before Him and recognize He's the one who's placed us where we are, and we ought to be uh, praising God for who He is and what He's done. And so, in every way, uh, we can take from God's sacredness and His holiness and tear that down by somehow living a life that is ungodly before Him. We, we remember something. When we become believers, we are the temple of who? The Holy Spirit. And if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit when you live out in the world, that means everywhere you go, you're representing the Lord. Everywhere you are. I mean, you don't just watch your language when you're in the church house. You have to watch your language everywhere, right? I have to watch my language when I watch the baseball game. I have to watch that. And sometimes, as my daughter would testify on the back row, I don't always do a good job. We recognize we're the temple of God's Holy Spirit. And as we represent the Lord uh, as ambassadors for Christ in the world, we've got to be really on point and careful that we're not mocking God by the way we live and by what we say. We need to be those people who are praying and seeking God, never mocking Him. And Bel King Belshazzar, he got in the he was in the wrong place before the Lord by the way he lived, by what he did. In fact, we read on in the scripture, and we read in uh, verse 5 and 6, In the same hour the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part, the hand, uh, the part of the hand that wrote, and then the king's countenance changed. And his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Now, that's talking about being scared, right? You are overwhelmed with fear. Why? Because you've, you're seeing something you've never seen before, a supernatural event where God's hand is writing on the wall. But you also recognize, I think in that moment, how far away from the truth you'd been living. You know, when you, we, get, we can get overwhelmed with fear when we realize how far down the wrong path we've been going. And Belshazzar had been going down this wrong path for a long, long time. And now he is going to be judged for what happens. Oftentimes, I think, even as believers, we put, a, put aside the thought that we're going to be judged for our actions. But God's Word tells us we're going to be judged. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. So in knowing that, even as a believer, we ought to respect the holiness and worthiness of our one true God. Here, King Belshazzar didn't realize, the, I, I think, the momentous uh, ugliness and ungodliness of his actions until he was finally in the moment and God confronted him with his own hand writing on the wall. So when we look at God's word in this story, we see Belshazzar mocking God by uh, giving tribute to the gods of gold and silver and iron and stone and wood and in, in a great way uh, pretending the God of the universe doesn't even exist. And in all of their revelry, in all of their uh, feasting, in all of the things that they did, I'm sure he never thought in a million years that, that the holy, true God of the universe would confront him, but he did. And in confronting him, it scared him out of his mind, and he should have been, because uh, the great uh, uh, consequences that were going to come were enormous, not just for King Belshazzar, but for the whole kingdom. So <coughs> what happens? We... We recognize when the enemy is at the gate of your life, like it was for King Belshazzar, he should have been praying and seeking after God, not mocking God. He should have, secondly, recognized the Lord weighs all of our actions. And that's exactly what this message was about. Mene, mene was a word that means number. And it was written on the wall two times. 
to emphasize twice as much your, your actions are being numbered by God. And then the tekel was a word used to talk about weights and measures. And it means your life has been assessed by God. Your actions and your spirit has been assessed by God. And you've been found wanting in your life, meaning you uh, have, have failed and fallen short of what God expects from us. So we recognize the Lord weighs all of our actions as he weighed King Belshazzar's actions. The last word, Eupharson or Perez, that you see in the later part of the, uh, the interpretation that Daniel gives. It means that your kingdom's going to be divided. It's going to be divided up between the Medes and the Persians who are the enemies at your gate waiting to come in. And the remaining part of this story is that in verse 30 and 31 of this chapter 5, it tells us what happens. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And so that's when the Medes and Persians came in and took over everything, took over the whole region. So when we look at this, we see one of the things that takes place is God uses Daniel as a messenger again because the queen mother uh, who was married to Nebuchadnezzar lets her son know, uh, son, you're, all of your soothsayers and your wise men are not going to be able to interpret the writing on the wall but there is a man who is filled with the spirit of God and he's the one who can interpret it for you and that was Daniel and so they summoned and got Daniel there and Daniel gave him the interpretation that we read a few moments ago that interpretation that says that uh, Belshazzar had had uh, was found wanting and his kingdom was going to be yanked away from him and divided up um, from among him and it was all because of the way he lived his life and all because he was not willing to uh, recognize the Lord God of all the universe weighs our actions and brings judgment now some of us we sit back and we see everything happening in the world and say we're saying where's the justice in all this all right, we're, we're seeing the things that are happening in the world among the, the wars that are happening and uh, that have popped up in these last uh, uh, couple years. And we're saying, where's the justice in that? Where is God in this? Well, again, God has given us the ability to make choices, and we as human beings make those choices. But let me assure you, there will be judgment upon the earth. Bec how do I know that? Because the Bible tells us that. We see the judgment coming. We see the time in which we're living. And we know we're living in the last days before Christ returns for his church. And I'm excited that it could happen while we're all still alive. Wouldn't that be amazing? But yet, even if it doesn't, the, he's coming soon for his church. It's in, inevitable and it's, it's something that's going to take place. And we're inching closer and closer every single day. But yet God, in his mercy, his love, his grace, wants as many people as possible to come to know the good news of Christ before he comes. Before that terrible time of the tribulation takes place here on the earth, and we see the signs of it inching closer to us all the time with the wars, the rumors of wars, all of the natural disasters that happen, everything that takes place, even the unrest that we read about and we see on our TVs on college campuses. That's all a direct result of the evil in our world, and, and it, it starts in the education system, folks. It starts with kids being educated with, uh, with uh, uh, doctrine and stuff that is so ungodly, it's just, you know, I, I couldn't even imagine growing up today knowing the time period that I grew up in and the kind of influence I had, uh, whether it was in school or in college or in seminary or wherever it might be. So we recognize we're living in this 
chaotic time, we re recognize, too, that God speaks to each one of us, and each one of us has a story before him. A story that he begins in us, and we come to know Christ as our Savior, and then our story continues to grow as he works in our lives. We honor the Lord, but we need to always recognize he's holy, he's worthy, we are not, except through Jesus. The only way we are found holy and worthy is through the life of the Lord Jesus who lives in us. So as we're temples of his Holy Spirit, the Lord is going to weigh our actions and we, we can guarantee, be guaranteed there is judgment that comes. Even believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We read about in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. We all stand before the judgment seat of the Lord. But we all also, just like King Belshazzar, we write our own story. The handwriting on King Belshazzar's wall was all about who? It was about him. He had been found wanting. He is the one who slipped up. He is the one who mocked God. He is the one, uh, because of his leadership, the kingdom was now facing siege and also being overrun and taken over by the Medes and the Persians. Why? Because he was not just a poor king, he was a poor person. He didn't live a life that honored anything. I think we probably see some of that in our world around us today. People living lives that don't honor anything. We need to be those folks who are in prayer before our Lord. That's why we're meeting tomorrow night too to have the National Day of Prayer to recognize our nation needs believers to pray. Our leaders need... Now, I don't... I, I realize that all of us in here could express all the opinions of the world about uh, our president and our leaders, right? Everybody's got an opinion. But it's not our opinion that matters. What is the very best for our nation and for what God could do in America? That's what we need to be praying for. We need to be praying for the best that God can do through us, that we would open ourselves up and we would let the revival begin within us as believers. And as God works and begins through us, that it could sweep across this nation and there could be a change. That our leaders could change. Not just the physical persons change leadership or change presidents or change government officials. I'm talking about people's hearts changing. People's attitudes changing. King Belshazzar surely needed an attitude change, but it was too late for him. He was going to experience the judgment of God. His story had already been written and God judged him in it. You know, blessing comes when we trust God with our lives and we, we trust God with our story and God with what he wants to do with us. Darius the Mede took over uh, the uh, kingdom and he was going to lead after a time as, with experiencing Daniel as a leader alongside him. After a time, he was going to uh, lead in an in a honoring way before God. And there would be others like King Cyrus that would come in who would honor the, the God of Israel. And so there, uh, God uses the pagan rulers of the world to bring uh, his people unto himself. That's why it's so silly that people walk around trying to condemn the Jews. The Jews are God's chosen people. And we are grafted in to the chosenness uh, because of what Jesus has done for us. But you realize every writer of the Bible in the Old or New Testament except one was a Jew. Luke is the only guy in all of the Bible who's a Gentile. Everybody else is a Jew. And guess what? Our Savior is a Jew. And he is because God intended that to happen. So people running around and, and trying to 
uh, speak anti-Semitic things or any other kind of, of uh, uh, hatred toward anybody. It goes against everything we say we believe as people and as people of, as, as God's people. So when we think about the judgment of God over everything, we need to realize our choices count. Belshazzar's choices counted. He chose to dishonor God. Well, we as God's people need to choose to honor God. Amen? In John 19, verse number 35, I just want to end with this. When we talk about what our story was about, we have a testimony to share, a temple of the Holy Spirit to share with the world. And our testimony, is, as, as Jesus says, says it, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. We tell the truth about Christ so that people may believe. And we don't want to... Uh, we don't want to be those people who live in dishonor before the Lord, even as believers. We want to be those people who come before our God and we write our own story before him. And as we write that story, we write it as a Christian believer writes a story. That we would uh, give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise for who we are and what he's done in our life. The handwriting is on the wall for all of the world because guess what? Uh, God's already written it and he's given us his word ahead of time and we know what's going to happen. So since we know that's going to happen, we need to take our individual story and we need to share our story with the world, our testimony of faith, our testimony about the truth, our testimony that we are all as believers instruments and temples of God's Holy Spirit and when we do that the amazing thing comes that it is a foregone conclusion just like the handwriting on the wall that people's lives will be changed when we live our lives as a Christian believer amen people's lives around us will be changed because the influence that God gives us comes from his spirit it comes from his holiness comes from his righteousness, comes from his blessing, and he wants to bless us. He blessed Daniel immensely. We're going to get in more into that uh, next week when we meet, but uh, Daniel's life was immensely blessed, even in the middle of challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge. God still took his man and kept him front and center in that land. He does that for his church too. Never worry that the church is some, uh, somehow going to die and fade away. God's church is forever. But we need to live our lives in that kind of blessing and that kind of joy. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for Daniel's life and how he stood for you no matter how it was challenged. And thank you, God, that even though King Belshazzar dishonored you in so many uh, terrible ways you still brought a blessing upon the land you still brought a blessing upon the next kings that came into that land and Lord you still brought a blessing upon all of your people that dwelled there thank you for being with us thank you for the covenant promises that are here for your people for all of us as we are a part of your people and Father we just pray as everything happens in our world tonight, the chaos, the challenges, the hurts, the injustice, yet God, you are all holy, truly sovereign over all your creation, and judgment will take place and justice will come in your perfect time. And we count on that and we pray that you'll help us be the spark of revival that you've called us to be. We love you and praise you. Thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Phil, share with us.